right, everyone's getting a 25% pay cut. Try and find a seat with the word outside IR35 written on it. You cannot claim expenses for your travel and accommodation. Tell us what you're doing, otherwise you're out the door by the 28th of February. Hey guys, thank you for joining us on the Stage 1 podcast. A very special one for you here today. Uh, we've got Dave Chapman here from Contractor Calculator, who's going to take us through some of the ins and outs of IR35 and how it impacts you as a contractor and also as a client as well. Hello Dave, how are you? I'm good, how are you guys? Yeah, really good. Yeah. Very busy. Very, yeah. very busy. Yeah. <laughs> it does seem to be a particularly busy uh, time at the minute, doesn't it? We're recording this in January at the moment. It is extremely busy at the moment. I've just watched uh, an HMRC webinar and discovered after they did a poll that about half of the companies aren't ready at all to implement the reforms and have done nothing about it so far. I would say at least, at least half. <laughs> at least, yeah. As a minimum. So yeah. that's a bit worrying, um, but we knew it would happen. It, people tend to do these things at the last minute. So it's going to be quite the challenge to get all of these firms uh, ready and prepared. So yeah, that's the subject of today's podcast, and I'm you know I'm super excited to learn from you you know more, more about this, and I think it's certainly something that here at Stage One you know it's going to become a, a core piece, a pillar of our um, our consultancy strategy and, and what we're going to be able to offer people, both contractors if you're a contractor watching this you know uh, stay tuned, and also from a client perspective as well because so many clients we're talking to just don't really know what's going on right now. And they're really worried about it as well. Yeah. So hopefully this will help demystify and, and really kind of set the stall out um, and uh, you know help us all be a bit more informed. So look, thank you so much for joining. Um, let's start, Dave, by just um, introducing yourself a little bit. Tell us who you are, your background, and a bit more about your organisation. Sure. So um, my background is um, I was a techie myself. I used to... Um, lead teams of developers to build online banks in the 90s. I was around when the original IR35 legislation came in and it was first announced um, in March 1999 and then it was refined in November 1999. It came in in April 2000. So I was part of that whole wave of contractors got affected in the, the first time round. Um, then in 2004, I started Contractor Calculator uh, full time having um, spent the last five years sort of, sort of having it as a hobby site, really. Uh, we built the first ever IR35 calculator online, so people would ascertain their impact. So now for the last well, more than 15 years, um, my whole life has been as a champion for contractors, helping people to go contracting, stay contracting, and help them to learn all of the, the skills they need to to stay as a contractor, in addition to just the skill they have as a contractor. Mm -hmm. Okay, so your business isn't really around con uh, accountancy or the sort of financial side. You're really a, a kind of contractor coach, would you say? Um, I would say so. I mean, lots of what we do is around um, the financial aspect of things. Um, my background is mathematics um, and some accountancy. So the, the website started by helping people understand what they needed to do. Um, um, and how the tax was applied and so on, because it's pretty complex. Um, so we try to make that simplified for people so that they can understand the tax, tax implications when they do go contracting. So we're quite heavily involved in the tax side of things and accountancy, and, and I'm particularly involved in the legal aspects around IR35, because to ascertain someone's status, you need to delve into the case law rounding that, over 20 years I've been studying all of the case law and all of the cases around IR35. Mm, wow. Amazing. Yes, you are like the guru, the Yoda of, of IR35. I'm just going to call you the Yoda of IR35, if that's all right. <laughs> the, <guru. laughs> the yogi. Um, awesome. All right, so, so you mentioned that Contract Calculator started as um, you know, your own little pet project and grew out from there. So why did you start it originally? Um, well... Um, way back in November 99 when it first started, it was actually called something else and those uh, old enough to remember might have heard of a website called ir35calc.co.uk when it first started and that morphed into Contractor Calculator. And after learning about the changes in the legislation and understanding that there would be a financial impact on contractors, 
I decided to start building internet applications for the first time. Um, back then, there, there weren't many people who delved into the web. We all used to program in Windows. So it was a, let's try and build a web application site. I'm now sounding very old indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so um, over a, a weekend, um, with help of my brother, who was a chartered accountant, he put together a spreadsheet, um, all the tax calculations. Um, and from there, I then built the first ever online tax calculator for people to work out what the impact on them would be. And that's how it started, just as a hobby to, to, to build a, a web application, really, to help contractors understand the impact. Mm, okay. And, and how did you grow it? Did you see more and more traffic and people were asking for more and more features and it grew organically? Or how can I do it? The whole thing grew organically by people um, recommending it to their friends. Um, we've never really advertised at all. Um, and in the early days, it used to get around 5,000 visitors a month, mm -hmm. about 10,000. I think when I went full time on the website, it was about 10,000 visitors a month. Um, now, um, I think it was in November, we had just over 300,000 visitors. Wow. At the moment, we're, we're around about a quarter of a million a month wow. members. Uh, sorry, monthly visitors. Wow. I mean, those, those kind of numbers really speak to the fact that people just don't know what's going on. Because there's a huge amount of uncertainty and, you know, quite a lot of fear, actually, from yeah. you know, speaking to people that you know, we've been speaking to. Yeah. Uh, but then everyone's looking for some knowledge, right? Everyone's looking for some authority on, on what's going on. Yes. Yeah, there, there, there's lots of fear in the market surrounding this legislation, um, which is slightly unfortunate. Um, I tend to try and motivate people based on hope, um, but it appears that people react much better to fear. So the, the sort of fears that people do have are, this is going to cost me money. Um, so for the, for the clients and the hirers, well, they're worried that all this extra tax needs to be paid. They, they have a new tax bill to pay themselves. The only way they can really remain in cash neutral is to give contractors a 20 to 25 percent pay cut overnight um, that's not going to be an easy win for any organization really and um, so they they have an issue they have an administrative overhead to get through this um, and for the contractors they have a real issue in the sense that well whilst um, um, their position financially is perhaps a 10 percent pay cut um, and they will need to increase their rate of it, it's, if the client is trying to push their extra taxes onto the contractor and the contractor is trying to increase their rate so that they don't get affected, you've essentially got a bit of a tug of war going on between contractors and clients as to who is going to pick up this extra tax bill. Um, and it is a, it's a new amount of tax that needs to be raised. It needs to be found somewhere. Yeah, it's really interesting. So, so yeah, there's, it's, it's about margins being squeezed and about someone having to give and maybe both sides having to give, ultimately. So, you know, this is, this is roll, being rolled out in April. That's right, isn't it? This, this kind of new legislation? Well, it, it will become law in April. Mm -hmm. It's not law yet. The finance bill is on um, to mark the budget this year is March the 11th. That's when we should find out whether it's definitely gone live. Um, the draft legislation has already been published quite a while ago. They have announced that it won't be changing at all. Um, famous last words, sometimes things might change. There is a consultation um, undergoing right now because there was lots of lobbying done um, by our company and our campaign um, all last year. And we managed to get the Conservative Party to sign up to an IR35 review that review has sort of turned into not really a review, but um, another consultation where they're going to try to understand how this reform can be implemented without causing too much damage. And it's already being rolled out by all the companies. Um, many companies have found the situation too difficult for them, um, particularly in the financial sector. There aren't many financial organisations that are even prepared to engage with the legislation and try and hire um, contractors on an outside IR35 basis. They've taken blanket policy decisions and have just said, right, everyone's getting a 25% pay cut. Tell us what you're doing, otherwise you're out the door by the 28th of February. 
Mm. That's the situation we're in at the moment. And there's quite a cliff face um, that's building up for firms and contractors where large numbers of, of projects will be, well, um, will be disrupted, I would say, by the end of February. And how do you see that affecting these businesses? And how does that kind of have a knock-on effect on contractors? Um, well, for the contractors, for them, they're going to be trying to find, the, the game will be, um, next year, try and find a seat with the word I, outside IR35 written on it. Um, it's going to be particularly a, a large game of musical chairs, find those firms that are prepared to hire on an outside basis. Um, many contractors, long-term long contractors, will want to do that. Many of us are saying to us that they will not even consider a contract that's inside IR35. So whilst companies are putting pressure on them to sign up on a PAYE basis at the moment, they're just stringing it out and they have absolutely no intention to do so. They will just walk at the end of February. So if you're a company and you have a project sourced with 20 contractors and they all leave overnight, you're going to have a bit of a problem. So firms need to understand and get certainty themselves who's staying and who is leaving. And, and what do you think firms and uh, companies are going to do once that does happen? These, these contractors are going to leave, they've got a project that needs to fill in, where do you think they, they're going to go next? Well, we are seeing lots of firms um, start to outsource and, and push the work offshore. If they're global organisations, then the work is leaving the UK and they're sending it to one of their other head offices in another country. Um, the contractors um, are then trying to look for work elsewhere. We've seen uh, many contractors are taking on contracts that are closer to home because under the new legislation, you cannot claim expenses for your travel and accommodation. And that's proving to be a major problem. So the, some of them would be perhaps quite happy to stay on an inside basis, but they won't travel far afield anymore. Um, and typically a contractor who will travel down on a Monday, stay four nights and come back on a Friday, they could have expenses in the region of £15,000 a year. Um, between ten and 15000 well, if you can no longer claim for that pre-expenses, you won't be travelling. So firms that, that really do rely upon contractors from far afield, they are going to have a problem, particularly if they cannot obtain those, those skills locally. Do you see a lot of companies uh, going to agencies in the UK? As you mentioned, a lot of companies are looking abroad. Um, so that sounds like, well, okay, a lot of resource is going to be looked for abroad. That's taking, basically, skill sets outside the company, uh, of the country, yeah. which is obviously bad for the UK and bad for the economy. Yeah. So yeah. do you see, like, there's more people going external, outside the country, or do you see companies going, right, well, okay, we'll just go to agencies and be business to business? Um, well, I mean... They could, if they're going to other recruitment agencies, they still want the same problem. If they More decide design to design agencies to... Or, or, or development agencies, companies that can do the services for them instead of going to a contractor. Yeah, I, um, so we are seeing many firms deciding to then use consultancy, as I would say, rather than an agency. A small consultancy or some of the larger consultancies, um, there's a... There's a huge advantage for consultancies that are small in terms of the definition in the Companies Act, because under the new legislation, small companies are not within scope. So a small company that is a consultancy can supply um, workers on an outside IR35 basis to other firms, and because they're providing services rather than providing labour, then the legislation won't apply and we've pulled back on the original Chapter 8 legislation, the original board, where contractors then assess themselves for their own status. Um, that's not to say it can be used as a way to avoid the tax, provided they are outside IR35, um, that, you know, that can be done. 
I think in that instance, it would probably be wise anyway for those consultancies to actually still assess those contractors themselves and so that everybody in the supply chain knows that they are being hired and secured on an outside IR35 basis. It's interesting you should mention that because that's exactly the business model we're taking. So. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's exactly what we, we want to be doing. We want to be that small and yeah. Funny you should mention that, yeah. uh, which, is, uh, which is why it's so yeah. important to us. And it, this is why we want to make sure that we're, we are um, providing as much information to, to people as possible, really, because we want to be that consultant that people come to because we understand, you know, we partner with people like yourself to uh, make sure that organisations can just keep operational, right? And we see absolutely, it from, and we see it from the contractor's perspective because we've been contractors ourselves. So yeah, uh, we're yeah. creating this this, this studio. Uh, we know what contractors want. We can understand their their worries. So we're, we're wanting to find out from the business perspective how they they work and the lack of knowledge they have and how can they find that knowledge and how can we help? Yeah, them? yeah. I do, I, I, I do think this is a really good opportunity for consultancies. Um, the larger ones will have the uh, problem whereby um, um, they will still need to apply the Chapter 10 legislation because they are essentially the client um, in terms of the Chapter 10 legislation, they're the client. So that might and make it a bit more difficult for them, but it's all completely doable. Um, provided you're not a consultancy that is a body shop, bums on the seat, labour for hire consultancy, which is essentially a bit like an employment business, then this is every, you've got every opportunity to grab land and, um, and increase the size of your business. And you might soon be find that you become a medium one, <laughs> but quite quickly, <laughs> Um, if you adopt this policy, so yeah, there's a cap um, on a small company. So yes, it's, I think uh, lots of small consultancies may well soon find themselves becoming medium sized, which is why it probably makes sense to pretend that Chapter 10 legislation actually exists for them now, just get it right from yeah. the beginning. Yeah, and that's exactly what we're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do the assessments. Yeah. Okay. Let's Don't start offering contractors that are actually inside IR35. I just think that would be a terrible business model, mm -hmm. long term. Just for the sake of people who may have heard of IR35, but don't fully understand it, just like they, they're just worried, but they don't know why. Can you take us back and give us a really basic definition of what IR35 is and um, you know where it might impact a contractor? Sure, sure. So um, HMRC have this um, perception that there are people working in companies that if it wasn't for their working through their own uh, limited company, that under existing case law and the case law tests for employment, they would be considered an employee in law. Um, but they think that because they're being hired through a limited company, there is the perception that large amounts of tax is being avoided. Personally, I think that's a false, false perception. I see the legislation as a tax prep. Um, so that's essentially it. Is this person who's being hired, being hired just like an employee, or are they genuinely like a self-employed contractor? Um, and there are tests in law for that. So that's what they're looking for. They think there's tax that's being avoided. Um, and maybe in some instances that's valid, but in others I don't see it at all. Um, typically in IT, which is my main, main area, um, to hire someone who is a contractor and isn't given any rights whatsoever and can be dropped to that, drop, dropped any time, um, they've got very high skills. If I hire one of those compared to a permanent employee, I typically have to pay twice as much for them. So HMRC in that instance, for what would be the same person, are getting a slightly smaller slice of a much bigger pie, but they they just want more pie. Mm -hmm. That's the way I see it. And so it's disappointing. Um, they see that in the market there's a, a, a large... Um, um, HMRC in the market that there's more and more people becoming self-employed so what they're losing out on is employer national insurance deductions. 
Um, for anyone who is employed, they probably don't know what these are because it's just something that appears on the payslip and you don't really know about it. But if, if you have a salary of, say, you know, you've signed up, if you have a salary of, say, £50,000 a year as an employee, your employer has to pay extra taxes to the government on top of that just for the privilege of hiring you. And those are 13.8% employers' national insurance and apprenticeship levy of half a percent, and you've got pensions and so on, and it all adds up. Now, those taxes are not payable when you hire a flexible worker who's through a limited company. So the perception is, and, and, and the rhetoric by HMRC, is that tax is being avoided by contractors, which is sort of not really correct. Um, the tax that's being avoided is all the employment taxes that the company is hiring the contractor no longer has to pay. Um, but it is what it is, and um, that's the way it's being pitched. Um, I think that's a bit unfair. Um, essentially, that's where we are. I was going to say, so, so where does the liability for this rest? So when HMRC decide they want to go after someone, who do they go after? Do they go after the contractor? Do they go after the company who's hired the contractor on a flexible basis? How does it work? So in the past, under the original rules that will still apply um, for small companies, they would go after the contractor. And they would reverse out the calculation to say, even though you've paid this much corporation tax and dividend tax and so on, there's still this much extra that you should have paid. Um, and then they will challenge and they will ask lots of questions to everybody um, and ascertain whether or not you really are a deemed employee in law. So that's the old way. That didn't work very well for HMRC because they hardly ever won any cases. Um, it's very difficult to pin on somebody that they're an employee. And also, if there was no money, in the contractor's company and it wasn't capitalised, then even if they win, then they don't really get money. And that's the problem they, they for support. Um, so for the last 20 years, it's been a very, a very toothless piece of um, legislation. They tried to enforce it for many years, but uh, have discovered that they just can't. So that's why under the new rules, everything's changed. Uh, under the new rules, um, the, 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 the only similarity is there is the concept of deemed employment, a deemed employee, but the tax calculations are in fact different. And this is what's causing a massive problem for all of the clients. So under the original legislation, you would take the amount of money that the contractor was paid, and from that you had to consider that as the total cost of employment, including all of the employment taxes. So you would have to first reverse that out to find out or what would be the employment income. For example, if they were paid £400 a day, probably around about £46 of that would be the employment taxes. So then they would have £346 left, £354 left, sorry. And then from that, you apply taxes of employees, national insurance, and PAYE income tax. So the, the cruel part of the old legislation was that the contractor was getting double tax. It's double taxation, which means that the actual marginal rates of tax for that contract are huge compared to what someone, if they were actually employed by, by somebody, would get because uh, employees don't pay their employers' tax bills. So under the new legislation, this has changed. So let's say the contractors still pay £400 a day. That has to be treated as employment income, um, as per definitions in um, Finance Act. And it means that the employment taxes have to be paid on top of that £400 a day by the person who is the deemed employer, which is essentially the agency. Um, so that needs to be found from somewhere. If they can only deduct primary um, national insurance on the £400 and the PAYE, because that £400 has to be treated like salary. And in law, can't start deducting secondary class one national insurance contribution from a salary. Um, that's the Social Security and Contributions Benefit Act. Um, you're just not allowed to do that. So this is the problem all these firms are facing if somebody goes from being operated on an out outside on our 35 basis and gets being paid gross, they want to push them inside 
Well, in order to find that extra money, they need to renegotiate those rates and pay and offer them £354 a day, not £400. And then they need to offer them even less because it's employment income, they're going on PAYE, they need to account for holiday pay, pension contributions, and so on. Which is why you see in the market most firms offering contractors same arrangement but with a 25% pay. And you cannot claim for expenses. That's incredibly expensive. So what should, what's your advice to contractors when they're looking for their next contract? Um, I think first of all you have to, you want to ascertain what the like status is going to be, inside or outside. I think you need to understand whether the agency is engaging in the whole um, chapter 10 legislation and also potential clients. That's the first thing you need to know is what's the likely status going to be. If it's outside, everything carried on as normal, no problem. If it's inside IR35, or if the clients and agents have decided they're not even going to entertain IR35 and they have a policy of just hiring people on PAYE only, you need to understand what rate you're going to be paid. Um, one, of, one of the problems we're seeing in the market is the rates are still being advertised as gross cost to the um, hirer rather than being translated into a reduced rate so that it's an employment income rate. And then what happens is they go on PAYE, they don't end up getting what they should be getting paid, the unlawful deductions are made, and it just turns into a complete mess. So we so that people need to understand exactly what the rate is when it's quoted and whether that's employment income or gross, or if it's maybe something that some some agencies are referring to things as assign, assignment rates, which is essentially the gross payment if you're going through a limited company. Um, there's no such thing in law as an assignment rate. Um, there's either there's employment income or you get paid gross. So contractors just need to be a little bit careful. There are um, some misleading contracts in the market where people sign up and it. And, it, and in those contracts, it allows the agencies or clients to actually deduct those taxes from them. So it's sort of, I guess, by anywhere, really. You need, you need to understand what it is you're signing up to. The good news is, from April next year, there's also some new legislation where agencies and hirers need to provide something called the information document to contractors. And this contains all the details of what they're getting paid, what the deductions are, and so on. So this should increase transparency considerably so people do actually know what they are going to get paid. Is there anything that uh, a contractor can, um, can see within a contract that may cause um, alarm bells? Was alarm bells for yeah, class, classic classic alarm bells for um, being considered a themed employee um, would be it's just a job title, providing skills for a minimum number of hours per week. That's the classic difference between someone who's employed or someone who is a contractor. Mm -hmm. So when you hire somebody to who's an employee, you're really hiring skills. And there's the work that wage bar bargain going on, whereby you say, you turn up to my office every week for a minimum of 40 hours, and I'll pay you just for turning up whether I give you any work or not. Mm -hmm. That's employment. And then if I do give you work, you are obliged to take on that work and complete that work. If I don't give you any work, I still have to pay you. But you are obliged to turn up and you're obliged to make yourself available. So that's employment. Self-employment, very different. You speak to the client up front, you decide what the scope of the service might be, what it is you're going to be working on, and that's the only thing you're going to be working on. You turn up to the client site, and if there's nothing for you to do that day, you don't get paid. If you, when you do do work, you get paid for the work you've done. The classic classic phrase um, that's always used in the courts for these cases is only getting paid for work done. 
So what we typically see with um, contracts that are fully outside IR35, there's no termination notices, there's no guaranteed payments, you're only getting paid for the services that you deliver. There's a scope of services, it says the name of the project you're working on, um, what you might be doing on that, there might be some deliverables, timelines and so on. But there's no obligation to provide any services or anything outside of that particular engagement. So of course that puts the onus on businesses now if they want to find people who are outside of our 35 and they want to attract that pool of talent, you know, savvy contractors have decided they don't, they don't want the risk of working inside anymore, to actually be much more prescriptive and put much more work into their project briefs and the, ultimately the contracts that they create for contractors, right? Yes, I mean, they should have been doing this for the last 20 years. Um, <laughs> what, what have they been doing? Um, unfortunately, I think what we have seen is because there's been no cops on the road, really, enforcing IR35, um, for well, casting my mind back about 15 years, I would say it got quite busy around 2002 to 2004 on HMRC enforcement, and then sort of nothing really happened much after that. A few cases went through. Um, people got lazy with their contract terms. Um, clients would hire contractors, maybe to come in and do one project, and then they'd suddenly find themselves doing another project. Oh, can you hang around a bit? Can you do this? Yeah, I'll do that. But they never really up updated the contracts. There weren't defined schedules. Um, and contract wording and, and, and the contractual manner in which they're engaged was just lazy. Um, and well, that all needs to be tightened up going, going forward. So yeah, okay. So um, how do you think firms are doing with it, with assessing all of their um, contractors at the moment then? Um, it's, it's fairly mixed. Um, some firms have decided they're just not going to do this at all. Um, some firms are very much engaging with the process. Um, what, what we are seeing, one of the major problems we're seeing, it really stems from what I was saying earlier about there being contracts that have been lazily drawn up in the past. So um, firms are assessing contractors based on their existing contracts their existing paperwork and what they've been doing in the past, as in everything they've been doing, I guess, under sort of a chapter eight pre-April 2020. Um, and because there's been such a wide range of contract paperwork out there historically, we're seeing contractors that, based on their working arrangements, really should be outside IR35, but are being told they're inside IR35. We're seeing contractors that are definitely inside IR35 with paperwork that would indicate they're outside IR35. So, in a nutshell, the whole thing's a bit of a mess, frankly. Um, what, we, what we think firms should be doing, and, and it's what we advise, is to essentially just throw away the existing paperwork that they have and assess everybody based on what the true relationship is between them and the contractor. So, to ask all of the questions that need to be asked, um, and then assess what's going to be happen going forward, um, perhaps based on new paperwork that aligns with the working conditions they've established, rather than assessing what's been happening in the past, because there's so much paperwork that will let people down, I and mean, it'll make them appear inside IR35 when they're not, and vice versa. So it's really a, for many firms, it's a huge cleanup exercise, and it's not surprising that some of the organisations have just decided to effectively just press the reset button and say, right, everybody out at the end of Feb, um, and we're going to start again, and um, we're not even going to try, because, as I said, it's just such a mess, because historically people haven't really been paying attention to drafting contracts correctly. Okay, so what tips would you give to firms looking um, to sort this out, and maybe coming to the party a bit late? Well, I think, as I said, they, they should definitely be looking to um, essentially just define how they're going to engage with their workers. Are there particular engagements where they do really do want someone who's a bit more like a 10, um, where they, are, they do want them for a minimum number of hours per week, coming with their skills and just get directed about as and when, 
draft a contract that's accordingly for that, which would be inside IR35. And if they've got contractors working on project-based work, then draft paperwork that aligns with that, and then assess all of their contractors who are working on that basis together with that new paperwork. So very much focus on what's going to be happening going forward after April, rather than focusing on the messy past, which will which really will be a red herring, really, for lots of these assessments. Okay, so look, let's think about it this way then. Is it, is, it, is it difficult to hire someone that's outside of IR35? No, it isn't at all. And that's um, the most frustrating thing that's happening in the market, is that the market is full of fear, indicating that it's very, a very difficult thing to do. And it's not at all, provided the paperwork is correct. They're coming in on a project as a definite start and an end, they're only getting paid for work done. This is the easiest thing to do, and provided you get all your ducks in a row, um, I just can't see how HMRC would win one of those cases. And if you look at the case law over the years, they've never won those cases. They only ever win cases where people are coming in, they stay there forever, they're tailing Charlie's, working on whatever they're asked to work on, um, just like employees. So it's it's actually very easy to do. It, there's, no, there's no difference between hiring someone to work on an IT project for six months than there is asking someone to come in and build a great big shed in your back garden for six months. You know, while they're there, you don't say, right, now I want you to build a rabbit hutch and a great big play area for my children. They can say, well, no, I'm not doing that. The deal was I'll build the shed and I'm doing the shed and then I'm off. Um, and if you'd agreed a day rate for them to build the shed, you would only pay them those days they turned up and built the shed. And if there were days when they couldn't do it, maybe because you didn't want them to have access to the garden while you're away, you wouldn't pay them and they couldn't turn up and expect to get paid. So if you think about it how and compare it to how you hire tradespeople all the time, this is the easiest thing to do. But unfortunately, there's lots of fear in the market and firms don't really understand how to do it. It's not difficult though. Part of what we're offering here at stage one um, is that organisations can engage us on projects and then we can use this network of talent that we've got access to, effectively contractors who want to work outside IR35, to uh, facilitate that. So when we're working directly, the, the engagement is with us as a consultancy and with the client, the end, the end business that needs that service provided. And then we are commissioning effectively those contractors on IR, outside of IR35 basis to get that work done. Now, you know, we think that that is going to be a really simple, you know, straightforward, effective way for clients to get their, um, you know, their work commissioned and their their projects completed. Now, how does that sound to you? Do you think that makes sense? It makes absolutely sense. I think in law, um, it's the easiest thing to do uh, based on the case law. Um, not difficult for you or, or difficult for the contractors or really difficult for the clients. The problem and challenge you'll face is convincing the clients that this is perfectly okay. So you might want some independent opinions from barristers or tax advisors that demonstrate this is okay. You maybe might need to indemnify all the clients who are scared. Um, they might to be need to be educated more that this is not a problem for them. Um, maybe even go as far as speaking to HMRC and asking them to tell you that it's okay. Uh, this whole the whole aspect of whether it's a consultancy working here or whether it's labour for hire is problematic in the market. And HMRC aren't really helping people on this one, it's, it's, uh, which is disappointing. But provided you've got the clients to understand that this is perfectly okay, no problem. I mean, for the clients, it's the most sensible thing to do. Um, it's, it's a complete no-brainer. They were using agencies before, well, now they can use consultancies. Mm -hmm. And consultancies are very well placed to do this because they understand how to engage people this way. Whereas agencies, recruitment agencies, typically think with the mindset of um, hiring employees and bums on seats and everyone's the same. So we are seeing lots of recruitment agencies suddenly deciding to become consultancies, but they're not really. Um, can you imagine an IT recruitment agency going in there and scoping out a project of work on a fixed price? I mean, well, that would all go horribly wrong. Uh, so I think there's, this is very easy for clients, perfect for consultancies, perfect for contractors. Why would you say there's so much fear in the market then? 
I think lots of the fear is driven by um, HMRC and the Treasury because they want everyone on payroll. The more they, people they can capture in their nets, the more money they will raise. Remember, this is a tax raising measure. That's one reason. The other reason is very bad advice from people with vested interests, um, particularly the payroll companies who will go in and advise firms about IR35 and they have absolutely no intention of supporting any contractors on an outside basis. They're just looking to pick up business um, to help them with their payroll. So that's particularly disappointing. Um, there's fear from agencies as well, because agencies don't particularly want to have to process contractors that are outside IR35, because they become the fee payer in the supply chain, and they have tax liability. So. If the clients and the agencies could continue to hire contractors and not have to pay them any more money, give them a 25% pay cut, I guess that's what they would prefer to do. But unfortunately, that's not what the contractors want to do, and market forces prevail. Um, no one can fix contracts rates across the market. And so this is a massive opportunity for um, consultancies and agencies and clients who are prepared to hire contractors on an outside IR35 basis and, and give them fair tax treatment. Huge opportunity. Okay, uh, earlier on we were talking about um, the, the uh, tool that you've created, this IR35 Shield tool, and it sounds absolutely fascinating. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that's helping organisations? Sure, sure. So um, we originally built a, an online IR35 test um, about 10 years ago, in fact, 2009. And when the legislation was changed in, uh, proposed in 2016, so then come out in 2017 for the public sector, and we rebranded re that test um, and wrapped it up in a service, both for contractors to use, for end clients to use, and for agencies to use. It, um, it uses some, something unique that we built called collaborative assessments, where we split the assessment up of to the three parties, so the agency and client can put all the information in about their contracts, the client can put all the information in about the working conditions, and then the contractor fills in their bits. Um, and then we join that all together and produce an assessment, um, and that will help clients understand whether the contract is inside or outside IR35, where there might be any strong pointers either way, and then any of those assessments is insurance backed should they proceed to hire the contractor on an outside basis. So we, we, we originally just had a single test someone could do, but we've now scaled it up so that we can assess a thousand contractors in the morning if need be. We then provide uh, reporting and drill downs for, for clients that have sort of that level of contractors. We can find out where there's particular problems. Um, there's all sorts of drill down and reporting that we can do, but it's, uh, and, for, and for clients, there's really um, no excuse now for assessing because a contractor can become a member of SHIELD and pay £20 a month and they get unlimited assessments. And if they're assessed by the client, it costs the client no money whatsoever and they're insured. So there really is no reason for clients and, and agencies not to engage in this process. And that's, that's what we've tried to do is to, to provide a service so that everybody can get fair tax treatment. Okay, that sounds amazing. Yeah, I mean that's 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 super enlightening. I think I've I've really learned a lot. You know, that discussion. I think it's great. I think what we need to do though, while we've got you here, is is ask you. You know, our resident expert. What do you see as the future of con of contracting in the next you know three months, one year, and beyond? I think certainly in the next year or so. Um, well, what we're seeing right now is is panic by firms that have left things too late and. They're trying to do all their assessments and get things ready. Um, January is going to be very busy, certainly February. Um, as we lead at past April, we're going to see contractors leave firms um, because they've been assessed on an inside basis. They're not happy with that. And then sort of six months after that, going towards the end of the summer, by that time, I think firms that have adopted poor policies and haven't been able to hire contractors on an outside 35 basis, by then they would have seen that their higher costs have increased significantly and they're not getting projects done. And by that time, I think we'll then really start to see a turn in the market and, and go back to normal where firms are engaging contractors, either through consultancies or through recruitment agencies that have got grasp with the legislation and how to manage it effectively.
All right, David, look, thank you so much. That's been super insightful and really, really helpful. And yeah, hopefully everyone who's been listening has uh, taken as much away from it as I know I have. Yeah, I found yeah. it great. It's been um, useful. So yeah, thank you for your time. And uh, bye. Thank you very much. Okay. You're very welcome. Good luck, thanks. Cheers, chaps. Uh, cheers. Bye. Bye.